Welcome to Safety Factor, my name is Ben Hangst, and today we're talking about renewable energy trends. Specifically, we're going to be looking at wind energy and how it affects the lifting and rigging industry. I'm joined by Tyler Henley, National Account Manager for Specialty Ropes, and Jason Coleman, Specialty Ropes Service Manager for Mozilla, as well as Crosby Group's Director of Business Development for Wind, Ken Milligan. Thank you all for joining. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Ken, if you want to kick us off, how has the demand for wind energy grown in recent years? And then uh, what factors have contributed to its growth? From 2021, we saw the emergence of repower into the wind industry. That's where they decided to uh, give credits to tear down old wind farms and uh, replace them with newer turbines uh, so that they generated more power. They used uh, less turbines and was a lot more cost effective. When this happened, we uh, also saw maintenance and service of wind farms start to become more popular and emerge into a new, a new market. Um, and with that, we, we saw a change in, in the lifting equipment that we're using. Um, we went away from uh, traditional lifting slings and chains and fittings and started to use uh, single blade tools and blade yokes. We've seen similar on, on our side of the business, on the service side. Um, the, uh, the repower work is, is, is a lot more demanding on, on the, the wire rope itself. I know you're on the lifting equipment side of it more, but um, it's, a, it's a completely different application for wire rope. Like the, the um, you know, the, the cranes are getting larger. The way that the winches work are different because they're essentially going up without a load and coming down loaded. Uh, causes a severe wear and, and, and rope issues um, pretty consistently. Um, whereas on a traditional wind farm construction site, you know, a, a hoist rope might last the entire job. Um, on a repower job, they might go through two hoist ropes in the same time frame. So uh, it's, it's been a big transition for us. And the maintenance is similar to, you know, the, the, the emergence of, of a lot of smaller companies that are starting to get into the wind maintenance, uh, whether that's due to the onshore oil and gas being down um, or, or what is actually driving that. But the maintenance side of the business and the repower side of the business has been a big, um, has been a, a big increase for us as well over the last couple of years. Yeah, I've seen the OEMs the GEs and Siemens Gamesas and and uh, not so much Vestas. I, I don't know too much about Vestas. They've sort of always um, done their own tooling, sold all their own tools, imported their own tools, whereas the GEs and Siemens and Nordex rely on uh, uh, the, the local manufacturers for product. Um, so, yeah, in the last sort of 21, 22 and again this year, I think we'll see more repower work than we will see new wind farms. And that's solely uh, based on the production tax credits. That's where the government um, gave them more incentive to tear down the old turbines and put up new ones. So that's where we're seeing growth and more specialist lifting equipment being produced. Do you feel like that, um, and we kind of see it on our end, the, the 2021 repower credits you think that's forcing innovation from you guys i know it is us because we're trying to figure out the best ways to put these ropes on um and it and every day is a new challenge for us um how do you guys see it on your end traditionally um the lifting industry used you know uh, a lot more chain a lot more round sling material a lot more wear protection so that you didn't damage tools or blades when you're lifting uh, up. With the repower side of things, uh, it's all about how quickly they can get it done. So we've had to develop like blade tools that can form or uh, are specified to grip the blade rather than the traditional wrap around, sling around it and protect it just to stop damage being done to the, the tools repower and just the off 
onshore industry uh, generally, everything is getting so much heavier and so much bigger that we've had to produce wide body round slings, you know, high performance lifting slings are now all part of uh, the industry. Whereas before it was, um, let's just build the thing as easily as possible. <laughs> well, well, I, th- I think uh, the, uh, the, the wind industry in general has been kind of a, uh, so we've done really well from a, from a, a sales standpoint uh, on the wire rope side of, of, the the wind industry um it's really unique uh in the from from a from a sling and and sales perspective because it's what it's the industry is is the oems are buying a lot of the equipment and the actual crane rental companies which are typically our customers are the ones that are that are are doing the installs but they're not purchasing the rigging you know so um it's been kind of kind of kind of a unique uh it's been kind of unique for us to try to navigate that and try to work into that industry and figure out you know the the whole sales side of that is different than a than a normal you know normal sales for us yeah yeah the wind the wind farms that i visited and more recently the ones i visited uh a lot of the construction companies are purchasing their own equipment they tend to uh rent the large tools like the blade tools from the OEM like a, a GE or a Siemens Gamesa will rent the big tools to the construction companies um, but they but the construction companies themselves still buy a lot of shackles and a lot of slings and um, I see a lot of opportunities there for you guys to to be doing the inspection the selling and the maintenance side of work for those construction companies on site um, and training. They're always looking for, for training on site. I, I think um, the, sometimes the, the rigging equipment isn't given the same uh, training on site. It's definitely been taken for, for granted. I know we've, we've seen some with some, you know, Vestas in particular that, um, they have put a new initiative on training their field people. So we've seen a real big uptick in that line of business for us. So it's, it's an important thing um, to them. And I think it's starting to catch on um, to other companies. So, so let's talk a little bit about safety. Like obviously training is going to be one of it, but what are some of the challenges that come with uh, the safety aspect of things as these projects get kicked off and as the industry grows? On onshore wise, we're still seeing that the the components are getting bigger, and the guys in the field <clears throat> are being trained on just general lifting equipment. From our perspective, like with airpies in particular, with our blade yoke tools, um, we we need to be spending more time on site training these guys how to use our tools properly. Unfortunately, a lot a in a lot of cases, the tool will arrive on site and a tool has to be built. Uh, and there's not that many guys that are specifically trained on how to build these tools. So from that perspective, from an airpiece perspective, we, um, we're trying to spend a lot more time training the end user on how to use our products. So do you have like a, a specific training class for that? Or like what is, what, what, what is you guys' process? Generally, we we get, we have a one service tech in the country. He either goes on site or he can do it via web. We we do a lot of interactive training that way as well. But my personal preference is for him to be on site and and train the guys on how to build the tool, how to um, maintenance the tool. These tools aren't so much as you just plug them in and they go there's a lot of other work in the background that needs to be done with specialist lifting tools transitioning to offshore that's that's a a very scary industry Um, the components are so much bigger you have to get the components from land base on a barge system take it out to a ship or a vessel that's going to to build the wind turbine you've got so many factors playing in there like tidal movements waves wind yeah there, there's a lot of training and uh there's going to be a, a 
a lot of work needed to be done before we perfect offshore. Do you feel like the the onshore, as far as like um, support, is a lot more advanced than the offshore right now? Onshore here, yes, definitely. Um, we have net. Well, I think there is five or seven offshore turbines that have been built in the U.S. Now, I think there was five uh, originally. We haven't done any real construction for offshore since I think 2015 or 2016. The offshore industry is just going to be completely new. We've got to train a whole new workforce. There'll be a lot of unions involved in the offshore work as well. The unions are going to retrain all their staff to, to work both onshore in the marshalling yards, the ports, those facilities, and also offshore doing some of the uh, erection and maintenance. It's a steep learning curve, learning curve for the US. Obviously, we have a lot of Europe uh, knowledge that will come over, um, but we still have to train the US people as well. What are some of the uh, innovations that are coming out because of this, like technological innovations, or maybe there aren't any technological innovations, but can you see in the future technological innovations being well, I think adapted there, into this industry? I think there has to. Um, now, what that consists of, I'm not quite that smart. <laughs> well, I think you're. I think you're seeing it, like uh, Verton, as an example. You know, uh, we bring the Verton unit over for Mozilla, and we start marketing it. And the the first question we get is, how do we transition this to wind? And obviously, Verton is already working on blade systems to to be able to to do that. I don't think they're quite developed yet, but. Um, you know, that was the most consistent question we got when we started marketing the Verton was how, how will this work and when, or I know I, that's what I got from most of my customers. So I think it's happening, um, fluidly on and kind of happening on its own and the customers drive it, you know? Yeah, you're right with Verton. Uh, they're working on the Windmaster and that'll, that should be coming up soon. Cross our what is, fingers. What is Let's that, Ken? It's uh, like the spin pod. It's, it'll be a, a spreader beam for lifting blades that has gyro controls so that you remove the need for um, tag lines. It will basically hold a, a blade in position so that it can be stabbed into the rotor. It gives the operator full control of the, the blade tool and holds it in position. It's a it's a great safety device removing tag lines. I think everybody's seen that tag lines are, are dangerous in all construction, not just onshore and offshore wind, um, but all construction. And yeah, I think uh, Mazella have have really grabbed uh, the Verton product and started to to run with it. The other innovation I see as well. Um, what we've started to do, and we're in the, the process of trialing block cam. Um, block cam is a, uh, a camera system that we're going to add to blade tools so that when, they're, when the crane operator is going to stab or pick up a blade, he can actually get vision of picking up uh, the blade. The blades are marked or well, they're going to start to be marked again where the, the lifting points are. We've seen a lot of damage to blades in this industry by picking up the blade and the blade snaps because it's not picked up in the correct position. Or well, we started to do trials with some of the, the OEMs to put, a, to put the block cam on the blade tools. And also for tower lifting, when they lift a tower section, onshore there's always guys in the tower underneath the load so we put a block cam system there so that the uh, crane operator can actually make sure there is nobody directly under the load when he's lowering the sections of the tower and then how about the the spooling truck behind us uh, how can this support wind energy and moving forward with this industry. Yeah, I mean it's a little it's a little bit different because I think we're we're dealing with the rental companies, the crane rental companies that are being hired on these construction sites and repower sites and that kind of stuff, but we're we're getting um, we're, we're getting requests for for a lot of different you know, different tools for safety 
um, and a lot of protection on these companies. Um, uh, it's safety driven and it's also money driven. The cranes are getting extremely large and with the cranes getting larger, the ropes are getting larger. Um, so they're trying to protect their investment to not have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on downtime and rope, um, r- rope changes in the field. Uh, and they're driving us to develop new inspection tools and inspection uh, processes and programs that, that we're starting to implement this year. Um, so whereas, you know, typically in the past, you know, our, our main customer base has been has been the crane rental companies. It's starting to slowly but surely transition to the wind companies themselves, the construction companies. So they're the ones that are driving this um, and, and, and requesting, you know, inspections and, and, and that kind of thing. So it's pretty interesting for us as well. Okay, so we kind of talked about the challenges the U.S. is going to face uh, when they move into offshore. Um, can we talk a little bit more about that? I'd like to know a little bit about some of the challenges that Europe has already uh, gone over and they've, what they've done to get past those. And then is the U.S. going to face the same challenges or are they going to have different challenges? I think the U.S. is going to have the same challenges. Um, short term, I think the, the biggest challenges for the U.S. are we do not have the infrastructure in place to um, cater to these components, these large components. Everything on in the initial phase of offshore wind, like vineyard wind, as an example, the all the components will come from overseas. Uh, they'll be shipped over to the US and put into a marshalling yard or to a port, and then uh, will have to be shipped back out to the uh, installation vessel. When they do that, they have to use Jones Act, uh, Jones Act ships, which is an American flagged ship. So uh, we will have to develop a barging system or uh, a transfer vessel system where we take the components out to these ships. So to do that, we have to spend a lot of money on our ports to have uh, one, the weight restrictions for the ports themselves to be able to handle so much weight that's coming in. So yeah, we're going to see a big demand for new cranes, new warehouses, a lot of staff are going to be needed to, to be trained on how to handle these components that are coming in. Further down the road, there we are seeing that um, there is credits, again, like a, a, a tax credit for the developers the more U.S. product they use. So we're seeing that um, certain areas like um, Port of Albany, Port of Coimans, um, Virginia, New York are now starting to uh, develop the manufacturing processes here. We'll see the, the monopiles made here, just about every component other than the nacelle and the blades short term will be made in the, in the U.S. So... Yeah, that that brings challenges with itself. Having steel big enough to make the, the monopiles, um, I know that doesn't sound like a problem, but these monopiles are huge. I can only imagine. What about ropes? Using ropes at sea? Uh, oh, every, everything. I know. On, as far as oil, I know as far as oil and gas is concerned, everything offshore is double or triple the size offshore that it is onshore. Um, is the offshore wind? Is it is it going to be dictated by um, different regulations than onshore, like DMV and that kind of stuff? The, the lifting regulations and uh, specifications are interesting. There is no real offshore regulations in the US. Everything that's going to be done, I think, uh, would be handled by the Global Wind Organization, GWO or IMCA, which is... Uh, uh, International Marine uh, Contractors Group, um, and they set guidelines, and I stipulate they're just guidelines for lifting and rigging equipment. But yes, I see those being used here because um, there's just nothing else really available. 
what's your prediction on the tax credits moving forward? I mean, I know we have an election coming up and that's always going to, you know, dictate, um, you know, whether or not the tax credits are going to continue and that kind of thing. So uh, I know my personal opinion, you know, I was curious what yours was. I, I think offshore, we're probably too far along now to change anything. Um, any future tax credits for onshore, I don't see much happening. I, I really don't. Um, I think this administration has gone so far down the road of let's do offshore wind that uh, it's almost like onshore has become the ugly stepsister. And uh, I, 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 think, I think the tax credits will hold for offshore. I think... I think it's kind of, I think it's probably the case on onshore too. I mean, where I think we're too far along at this point for, I mean, they can't, they can't just eliminate an industry. No. Well, the tax credits for repower, they run for 10 more years. Um, if, if you had, uh, like in, at the end of 2021, if you had a wind farm in the process of repower and you did your applications, <clears throat> you have 10 more years to, to get that done. Um, I, I think that's the case. Yeah. I think it's 10 years. So, you know, we'll, we'll continue to see a lot more, um, repower work. I think obviously they, the OEMs are continuing to develop the onshore, um, nacelles and towers and blades and they're getting bigger. So we'll continue to see that, but that may require more tax credits further down the track. But you, you look at the size of a um, offshore wind blade, they're roughly 107 to 110 metres versus I think the biggest onshore blades now are about 77, 78 metres roughly. That's another 100 feet on the end that's, of a, a blade. That's so wild. And like when when this industry really started rocking and rolling, how how big were the towers? you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. <laughs> Not that big. Like, they, yeah, they, they really weren't anything like they are now. Um, the, the first towers, you know, maybe 50, 60 metres, and the blades were like 30 or 40 metres, but, yeah, nothing like these days. Yeah, it's so crazy. I mean, just even in, you know, in Oklahoma and Texas where, where we live, you know, driving up and down the main highways there and driving right next to them is just wild on really when you get up close to these things, just the masses, massive pieces of equipment they are. Yeah. And, you know, and that's the good part about the, the lifting industry as well, like high performance lifting slings and wide body shackles, you know, they made it so much lighter and so much safer i i think um the lifting industry has probably got better because of the renewable energy side of, of the industry the construction side because we had to develop to to lift such big awkward things safely and you know you go on site the sites i've been on more recently like every morning they they get a full tool crib of guys together that's the crane guys all the the head supervisors and then you go out to the actual turbine site and you know the rigging crew there'll be 10 guys sat around or standing around and the supervisor will run through everything that's going to happen that day and tell them every bit of the product all the different components they're going to use they'll inspect the components and then everybody in that team has to sign the sheet saying that you know they took part in the meeting they took part in the inspection it it really has got better over the last uh few years compared to 2010 i guess when i first started in the wind industry things were a little more relaxed but you know <laughs> the industry's come a long way and for the better and you know the offshore side is just going to make uh the industry even tougher and more strict, I think, 
on on the the lifting regulations um, once we start doing the work. Yeah, from I mean, from our perspective, I mean, it's really exciting. I mean, technically, we're still kind of in the infancy stages of the offshore stuff for the yeah. U.S. market, and so being on the, uh, for lack of better term, the ground floor, um, it's exciting to see it grow and see what what other technology comes about it. Yeah, and again, offshore is going like there is restrictions to the weight that those cranes can lift that are on those vessels. So, you know, the lifting equipment itself is going to have to be built to weight specifications. You know, they're not just going to grab the the heaviest lifting equipment they possibly can. They're going to need um, high performance materials because of the weight, the weights that they're lifting are so heavy. Thanks guys. So Ken, how can people get a hold of you? The Crosby group.com. We have a, a section on our website that's specifically designed around uh, the wind industry. You can click those tabs and you can get in contact with me there. All right, so be sure to visit the Crosby Group. As always, you can get a hold of myself, Tyler, Jason, or any of our other experts at MazzullaCompanies.com. Don't forget to pop into our learning center. We have a ton of information there. Subscribe to Safety Factor wherever you listen to your podcasts, or you can watch it on the Lifting and Rigging channel on YouTube. Thanks for listening, and stay safe out there.